I know what you're probably thinking. Can this dumb redneck seriously babble on about five more drivers who have come and gone? And the answer would be yes. Yes, I can. So here we go. Let's explore five more NASCAR drivers that you forgot about. Claire and Paige Decker. So to start us off, we're gonna get a two for one special as we discuss the Decker sisters, Claire and Paige. Now while their time in NASCAR was brief, and you may be forgiven for not recalling them as we all know their cousin Natalie who is still racing part time in a truck series today, and while some see her for her good looks and marketable smile and style, some know her for other things. Inside, 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 we're wrecked. But that's beside the point, let's talk about Natalie's cousins here. So, the Decker sisters are the daughters of Alan Decker, who was one of four Decker brothers who raced snowmobiles in the 1970s. And Alan was once a factory rider for Bombardier with his teammate Jacques Villeneuve in 1979 and 1980. Collectively, Paige and Claire first began racing along with their cousin Natalie under the family group of Decker Family Racing. Paige Decker, the oldest, first started racing snowmobiles at just three years old, and when Natalie Decker was nine, her father Chuck Decker bought her, as well as Paige, a competitive cart to begin racing. Within no time, all three of the Decker girls were getting a feel for stock cars on short trucks and Midwest road courses. By all accounts, most race fans would agree that the Deckers were fairly talented road course drivers. Now being the older of the two, Paige Decker made her transition to NASCAR sooner than Claire and was added into NASCAR's Drive for Diversity program in 2014. Paige competed with Rev Racing in the Wayland All-American Series at Hickory Motor Speedway, Langley Speedway, and Motor Mile Speedway. At the time she was racing, she was pursuing a degree in early childhood education at the University of Wisconsin Stout, but she would have to quit college that year to focus on racing in the Southeast United States, but she would return to school in 2015 while racing super late models. In 2015, Paige Decker received an opportunity to race in NASCAR's Truck Series for Mike Harmon Racing at both Martinsville events that year. She'd failed to qualify in her first attempt in the spring, but she would make the field in her second attempt and finish 30th of 32 trucks. In 2016, she'd return with Harmon's team to finish 25th in the Spring Martinsville event. On top of this, Paige Decker would make two starts in the Xfinity Series for Obica Racing, once at Iowa and once at Road America, finishing 31st in both starts. As for younger sister Claire, her career looks rather similar in NASCAR with two truck starts in 2016 of Jennifer Jo Cobb's team where she finished 27th in the Spring Martinsville race and 32nd in Iowa. She also attempted the 2016 Xfinity race at Iowa in Obica's 77 car, but she did fail to qualify for this race. Afterwards, that would be it for the Decker sisters in NASCAR while her cousin Natalie continues to race, but some could easily pose the argument that with little to no driving improvement, her chances could soon be dwindling away as well. <laughs> Brad Coleman Wow, what a throwback. Can you believe this guy was once believed to possibly be the future of Joe Gibbs Racing at one point? Coleman was first discovered and taken under the wing of Le Mans champion Price Cobb at an indoor karting track of all places. He began his racing days on the road courses in the Rolex Sports Car Series, even making history at the age of 16 when competing at Daytona. He was a part of a team of four drivers who finished 7th in the GT Series in a Porsche 911 GT3, and by Coleman being just 16, it made them the youngest team in history to ever compete in the world-famous 24 Hours of Daytona. He continued to train and work his way up the racing ladder until making the move to race in the ARCA Racing Series for nine races and a NASCAR Busch Series for two races in 2006. These Busch Series starts at Nashville and Kansas did not do much for him posting an average finish of 35th place, but his nine ARCA races would be a much different story. In his first ARCA start at Nashville Super Speedway, Coleman rolled off third, led for 12 laps, and would finish in second place. He'd go on to pick up three pole awards that year, and he'd hold an average starting position of third place. His average finish was 6.2, and if it wasn't for a crash at Salem, he would have likely had a higher average finish as he had eight top tens, and these were all top fives as well, and at Kentucky, he picked up his first career arc of victory. The next year in 2007, he only made one ARCA start, finishing 32nd at Daytona after crashing, and as for the rest of 2007, he had been signed by Joe Gibbs Racing to drive the number 18 Chevy part-time in the Bush Series. It wasn't necessarily a phenomenal performance, at least not if you compare him to some of Joe Gibbs' other Bush Series drivers of years prior and years after. However, by comparison to the other driver in the 18 in 2007, he was a bright beacon of potential. That other driver was, of course, Kevin Conway before he got the deal of extends. 
And even for that matter, he looked better than J.J. Yealy, their driver of the 18 in the Cup Series that year. However, for 2007, Coleman would make 17 starts, holding an average starting position of 14, but holding an average finish of 20th, which is certainly far from the pace that was to be expected of a Joe Gibbs Racing driver at that time. In 2007, he would pick up just five top tens, with three of these being top fives, including once at Kentucky Speedway, when he finished second to Stephen Light. The rest of the top five included Scott Wimmer in third, David Strimi in fourth, and Shane Huffman in fifth. Notice there weren't any big name cup guys in that top five, which is probably a big reason of why he had such a great performance. In 2008, he left Joe Gibbs Racing to pursue the driving duties of the Baker Curb Racing's number 27 Ford. However, this wasn't the greatest of runs as he had an average finish of 23rd and only two top 10s in 2008. However, that deal in the 27 came to an end early in 2008 after just 24 races once J.J. Yaley was released by Hall of Fame Racing's number 96 as Brad Coleman left Baker Curb to sign of Hall of Fame Racing full-time for 2009 and part-time in 2008. However, after just one Cup Series start in 2008 at Michigan in the 3 in Performance 400 in which he started last and finished 38th, he was released by Hall of Fame Racing and he was left without a ride for the remainder of 2008. In 2009, he returned on a partial schedule for Joe Gibbs Racing, making 8 starts in 2009 and just 6 starts in 2010, scoring 5 top 10s and 1 top 5 between those two years. However, after 2010, Coleman was not re-signed again by Joe Gibbs Racing, and nor did he have another NASCAR opportunity following 2010. <laughs> Elton Sawyer if you've ever watched a NASCAR Weekly Podcast or Danny B Needs a Minute, you have probably seen a University of Tennessee 164 scale diecast race car in my background. Well, this was actually a gift given to me by a fan of the channel as a nod to my college alma mater to University of Tennessee Knoxville. Well, this was actually a real car raced by Elton Sawyer at Bristol Motor Speedway as part of a deal with the Starter Athletics brand as one of 10 partner colleges highlighted on a number 98 Ford of Sawyer in 2001. He raced in NASCAR's Cup Series very briefly in 29 starts between 1995 and 1996 in the number 27 Ford. However, he would not score a top 10 and he did not lead a lap and his average starting position was 26 and his average finish was 29th. Now while his stats in the Cup Series may not have been impressive, his career within the Bush Series was certainly better, particularly within the 1990s. Altogether, he'd make 392 career starts across 20 years in the Bush Series, scoring two pole awards, 131 top 10s, 51 top 5s, he led 519 laps, and he picked up two career victories. One of those was at Myrtle Beach in 1994, and the other in New Hampshire in 1999. Off the track, Elton Sawyer notably maintained a relationship with Patty Moyes, a pioneer female owner and driver in NASCAR, who he'd eventually marry and is still married to today. Sawyer would eventually retire from NASCAR racing as a driver following three starts during the 2002 Bush Series season, and in 2015, Sawyer stepped in as the managing director of NASCAR's Camping World Truck Series, replacing Chad Little in this role. And since then, he has since became NASCAR's vice president of officiating and technical inspection. So even today, in 2021, we may still see Elton Sawyer within the sport, but maybe perhaps we forget about his time behind the wheel of a NASCAR stock car. <laughs> Tina Gordon No relation to Jeff or Robbie Gordon, Tina Gordon at one time tried to write her place into the NASCAR record books, but perhaps her career did not live up to what she had hoped for, or perhaps what her last name is in the world of auto racing. Before racing, Tina was an avid competitor on horseback in several rodeos and horse shows competing in barrel racing. In 1995, she began racing in her husband Gary's short track car at Green Valley Speedway in which she entered and won six events here between 1995 and 1996. From there, they bought a hobby stock car and they competed at Thunder Valley Speedway in 1997 where she would finish 10th in the track season points with 11 top 10 finishes and 18 races entered. By 1998, Tina sold off her insurance agency in order to pursue racing solely and fully in 1998, initially at Green Valley Speedway and then racing at Birmingham International Raceway. In 1999, Gordon would move up to the NASCAR All-Pro Touring Truck Series where she would finish 20th in the season point standings. 2001 would be a year of first for her as she'd make her first Bush Series start as well as her first ARCA start. In the September 2001 Bush Series race at Darlington, she made a start and park attempt for the number 96 Colby Furniture Chevrolet, finishing officially in 43rd place. 
A month later, she'd make her ARCA debut in number 22, Sticks and Stuff Furniture Ford, where she'd start in 5th and finish in 10th place. Now, fun fact about the Sticks and Stuff Company. They would, for the most part, continue to sponsor her in the remainder of her racing career, but when it ultimately ended, Gordon continued to be utilized by the brand in their commercials for television when they would advertise current specials at the stores. She would also make other various starts and attempts, particularly in the Truck Series in 2003 and the Bush Series in 2004. However, unfortunately, between 30 total starts between those two series, she would only record one top 10 finish with a 10th place finish at Talladega in number 22, Boss Motors for the Chevrolet, in her only start in the 2003 Bush Series season. She would ultimately stop racing after 2005 to focus on her family, and today she resides in Cedar Bluff, Alabama with her husband Gary. Today, Tina and her husband now have since founded Tina's Dream Ranch, a therapeutic camp for disabled children and adults. In addition, she became active in Alabama politics in 2008 when she ran for office of the Cherokee County, Alabama Commission. Larry Gunzelman this guy's career in racing first began out west in what was then the Winston West Series after first establishing his career in various West Coast racing series. In 1996, he recorded his best season in the Winston West Series with 10 top 10s, 8 top 5s, and his one and only NASCAR victory at Mesa Marin Raceway in Bakersfield, California. Likewise, he'd also be named the series' most popular driver during 1996 as well. Also in 1996, he made his Winston Cup Series debut at Sonoma, where he would start 43rd and finish 36th in number 35 Ford Thunderbird driving for Tamra Turner. Gunzelman would also attempt to race at Phoenix in 1996 for Turner, but they would be unsuccessful in qualifying for this race. The next year, back at Sonoma, Gunzelman would record his second start for Turner, picking up sponsorship from Caterpillar after David Green failed to qualify for that race. Gunzelman would finish 38th, and Tamara Turner would not enter another car in NASCAR after that race, at least for points, that is. Gunzelman would also be gifted the honor to compete in both exhibition races held in Japan in 1996 and 1997. He finished 23rd of 23 cars in 1996 and 15th of 28 cars in 1997, making both starts for Tamara Turner's number 37. Gunzelman would attempt to qualify for more Cup Series races between 1998 to 2006, but he would only qualify to start in five races in 2004, holding an average finish of 37th place in the Cup Series. He'd make 28 starts in NASCAR's Truck Series across four years, as well as 70 Bush Series starts in four years, including one full season in 2003, but he would not record a top 10 in either series, and his average finish was around 30th in both series. He would eventually stop competing as a driver after 2008, but in 2009, he would form Gunzelman Motorsports, fielding the number 64 before eventually fielding the number 37 a few years later. Eventually, Gunzelman's time as an owner would prove to be unsuccessful, as Gunzelman parked the number 37 after six attempts in 2012, and Max Q Motorsports would eventually bring back the 37 in July of 2012. And that's my 16th installment in the 5 NASCAR Drivers You Forgot About series. Thanks for watching today's video. Leave a like if you enjoyed it. It helps my channel out a lot. And if you're new here, be sure to subscribe for more great NASCAR content. The 2021 racing season is nearly upon us now. I'm Danny B, and I hope you have a great day. Bye, guys.